afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Um, on behalf of ASSET, let me take this opportunity to welcome you all to this event to launch the Smallholder Voices portal. Uh, as Rob mentioned earlier, my name is Edward Brown, and I'm the Senior Director, Research and Advisory Services at ASSET. The Smallholder Voices portal is a platform aimed at sparing conversation between smallholder farmers and policymakers. It is the culmination of a global scan study which ASSET conducted. My colleague Rob Floyd, ASSET Director and Senior Advisor, will be moderating the whole event, would elaborate further on the program. But before I hand over to him, I would like to give a brief overview of ASSET. Some of you may already know who we are. However, I thought it, it, it would be useful and helpful for me to give you a brief background of ASSET. We are a Pan-African Economic Policy Institute based in Accra but also have a branch in Washington. Our objective is to support Africa's long-term growth through economic transformation. We provide research, policy advice, advocacy, and institutional strengthening for African countries to develop their economies, reduce poverty, and improve livelihoods. We aim to advance African solutions to African transformation challenges. In our view, growth is not enough. Africa must transform. Thus, we work with Africa's public and private sectors to address policy and institutional barriers that hamper sustained and inclusive growth by providing research, policy advice, advocacy, and institutional strengthening for African countries. Our vision is an economically transformed Africa within a generation. And our mission is to help African governments and businesses deliver economic transformation that improves life. For the long term, we aim to transform African economies and support improved human well-being through diversified production, competitive exports, increased productivity, and upgraded technology. As a think and do tank, we apply knowledge by directly engaging citizens and decision makers. We bring an authentic Pan-African perspective to the field of economic development, augmented by our vast network of leading thinkers throughout the world. ASSET has been working in the agriculture sector for some time now, and since it is its inception, um, and in, 19, I mean, in 2017, we produced our second flagship report on agriculture as a driver of economic transformation. This was widely acclaimed as path breaking and it earned ASSET a global award. We have conducted a number of analytical work, particularly focusing on agriculture value chains in specific agricultural products in countries such as Tanzania, Zambia, Kenya, Ghana, Uganda. And recently in connection with the Global Scan Study we have also conducted uh, two studies on market linkages. Uh, market linkages is one area that the, our flagship report emphasized the, that is the mi missing link in terms of modernizing agriculture. So we, we are trying to understand the dynamics in this area. And this is a global portal, which we, just, which we are launching today, would offer us an opportunity to advance that conversation. So without much ado, I would like to ask Rob to come in. Uh, he's going to moderate the full session. Thank you very much, Ed, and a warm welcome to, to everyone, to our panelists and to participants from around the world. Um, it's an honor to moderate this, this discussion and we'll have uh, an illustrious panel of experts and I'm sure we'll have lots of uh, interesting and probing questions from, from our participants. In addition to Ed's introduction, just let me add that this project, Smallholder Voices in Policy Dialogue, is designed to help ensure inclusive policy design and implementation. We know how important the agriculture sector is to Africa, but we also know that it's sometimes difficult for the voices of smallholder farmers to be heard. 
we're launching this knowledge portal for us to all learn from good practices, successes and challenges, and innovative approaches for leveraging the voice, voices and concerns of farmers. We are grateful for the uh, financial support for this project from the Open Society Foundations. To get the portal started, the asset team is undertaking a global scan of literature on how smallholder farmers engage with policymakers. We have about 20 case studies completed and uh, have about 10 of them already published on the, on the portal, which the uh, team will go through a bit later. These case studies address the successes and failures of smallholder farmer engagements across geographies. They analyze the process of engagement and its outcome on a long-term basis to draw out the key lessons learned. I think a common theme or a few common themes that we, we see across these case studies is the need for strong ownership, both from government and from farmer organizations and farmers themselves, to move dialogues from being focused on short-term uh, issues-based uh, dialogues to more embedded, long-term, ongoing engagement between these stakeholders. Uh, the, the case studies also point to the need for feedback loops to ensure that uh, that feedback is, is, is going both ways, both to farmers and to government and other stakeholders. We plan this portal to be an interactive and engaging platform where smallholder farmers, academics, policymakers, and other stakeholders can, can connect virtually, and we see it as a learning platform. We also see it as a peer engagement platform, and we see it as a knowledge platform. We hope over time it will evolve as a forum to foster discussion and debate that can inform policymaking in this space. With that, let me welcome our panelists. I'll introduce each of them and ask them to make a short intervention on, on a few key questions. Um, they will each have about five minutes for that, and then we will move to questions and answers from participants. If participants would like to uh, submit a question, there is a Q&A button at the bottom of your screen in the taskbar. Uh, click there. We have a team uh, that's uh, monitoring those, and then we will uh, uh, try to get the questions up. Please uh, put your name and your organization and if your question is to one of the panelists in particular. Please note this webinar is also being uh, live tweeted and live streamed on Facebook. Our handle is at Asset for Africa. So let me uh, introduce our, our panel. Um, we have Benjamin Fiafor. He is the country representative for Ghana and Nigeria for Farm Radio International. We have Adil Mababu, he's a senior fellow at ASSET and the former regional director at the International Potato Institute. We have Kwesi Abaka Kwanza, the assistant director at the Ministry of Agriculture Extension, director at the Ministry of Food and Agriculture in Ghana, and importantly, he's also the head of the farmer-based organization desk there. We have Professor Ramato Mahama Al-Hassan, She's a former lecturer and was the head of the Econ Agriculture Economics Department at the University of Ghana. We have Anthony Morrison, who I think is still trying to connect, uh, but I'm sure we'll have him on. He is the CEO of the Ghana Chamber of Agribusiness. And fi finally, we have Michael Ampen. He's the president of the Greater Accra Poultry Farmers Association. A warm welcome to you all. So we can just jump right in. Um, Michael, maybe I will start with you if, if, that's, if that's okay. Um, from a farmer-based organization's perspective, how, how do you see successful policy dialogue happening? Um, for example, we, we, many of us have been following the association's efforts to um, increase poultry production in Ghana and, and decrease imports. Uh, maybe you could use that as an example. Uh, and you can give a little bit of background on yourself and the association. Uh, you have five minutes, please. Thank you, Rob. Um, like I said, um, I said, I'm Michael, and uh, I represent Greater Accra Poultry Farmers Association. We are a farmer-based organization. We have about um, 600 members, and uh, we were established about 42, 42 years ago. And uh, our business basically has been um, to bring together farmers, poultry farmers to be specific, and then uh, prepare feed for sale for them so that feed will be available at a relative, relatively um, uh, competitive price so that their businesses can be competitive. Um, directly to the question, um, we need to dialogue with 
all the stakeholders in the business, that is the crop farmers, we need to dialogue with the government, the municipal assembly, um, all the people, because um, one of the things that uh, is affecting um, farming and particularly poultry is urbanization. Um, so you set up a farm in an area where uh, previously was more like a forest or a bush area. And within, because you set up there and you set up a business, the people begin to uh, around you. And then before you know it, you are being pushed down because you are a nuisance, but you had developed the place. So we are asking that uh, we need to develop a policy where we can have a, a land bank, a land bank where we know that this area is purely for farming, be it crops, be it animals, be it uh, poultry, uh, is strategically left for, for farmers. So that the cost of doing business would come down because each time you need to go and start the, the process all over again and move people around, move your customers around, increase the cost of transporting your goods from uh, farm gates to, uh, to where uh, you can sell them. So it all becomes a challenge. The um, other thing is uh, a well-known issue that we believe that we need to have um, uh, dialogue with. And uh, it has to do with the importation of um, a frozen chicken. And uh, on our side, we believe in international business. So we do, we do not uh, believe that uh, importation of uh, poultry should be banned in total. We believe that there should be a, a sort of a quota system where uh, people bring in a portion and then the locals also produce a portion. Because currently in Ghana, the locals do about 10% of the total of about um, uh, 250 uh, tons, metric tons of uh, uh, chicken produced. So these are uh, the uh, areas that um, we need to look at. And we believe that if government looks at it uh, and, and works with us, because um, for us, for instance, the, the maize we consume, we consume a lot of maize for the, for the feed. Uh, we do currently we do about a thousand fifty kilo bags of maize per day, uh, which translates to about uh, three hundred thousand bags per annum. And so we believe that if we are helped or we dialogue well and we establish some of these things, then we are assured of the fact that the crop farmer is also uh, assured of a ready market. We also believe that the, uh, the soya bean that we produce, uh, the bags produce, we use it. We use a fish meal and, and a copra cake that comes from coconuts and all of that. So we are, a, 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 we are in a position where we can enable all the crop farmers have a ready market for their, for their produce. So we believe that when we dialogue in these areas and the value chain is established and is, is well oiled and we are able to move forward and move very well. So those are the, my initial thoughts, my initial comments for that. Thank you. Thank you very much, Michael. That, that, that's great. And you touch upon um, a couple of uh, quite tricky areas. Uh, land issues, of course, are, are always uh, tricky, and particularly in uh, Africa that is urbanizing very rapidly, um, and then uh, uh, trade and, and particularly quotas. I, I'd like to, to, to move to um, Professor Al Hassan. Um, you have in the past written about the political economies of uh, policy for, for in, in agriculture and agribusiness. And, and thinking about these topics that, that Michael has, has touched upon, ha have you seen um, for, from your work, particularly in academia, uh, examples of where some of these really tricky um, political economy questions have been addressed well um, by bringing together uh, the different stakeholders and particularly um, farmers and, and smallholders? Over to you, Professor. Okay, thank you very much, Rob. Uh, as you introduced me, I have worked with the University of Ghana for several years and retired recently. Uh, I'm now giving support to the TEDMAC program, which is the technical education for the modernization of agriculture, which is under the uh, Ministry of Agriculture. Now, I think that the uh, policy engagement process begins with identifying what needs to change and why. 
The primary role of research organizations is to generate evidence to inform decision makers. And most academics choose to stay within the bounds of conducting research and really do not want themselves uh, to be advocates. They provide the evidence for others to advocate on. However, researchers can make their roles and themselves useful by ensuring that their research meets at least three criteria, the credibility of the methods, the quality of recommendations, and the timeliness of the recommendations. Uh, policy making involves choices by decision makers. Uh, so the recommendations should present clear options and trade-offs to the decision maker. Though these options can be quantified financially, often the political implications are of importance to the decision maker. Timeliness of evidence is important because policies are meant to address real life issues and any delay in the process to intervene also uh, delays correction. In the context of today's launch, I think the Smallholder Voices portal will be a valuable channel for researchers to create awareness about ongoing research and to disseminate their research findings. Whether research findings are used for policy or not depends very much on whether there is demand for evidence. For that matter, the portal can also be a channel for advocates to express their research needs. The following example illustrates a case of policy change based on demand for evidence. In 2003, the National Development Planning Commission launched a poverty and social impact assessment uh, analysis of the food and agriculture sector development policy. This was the very first policy on agriculture. And the assessment was to find out if the policy for a modernized agriculture then could contribute to poverty reduction. The Department of Agricultural Economics and Agribusiness of the University of Ghana was commissioned to, to undertake this task. And their analysis concluded that the food and agriculture sector policy would not be able to achieve any desired impact, to achieve the desired impact on poverty. And therefore, the recommendation was to review the whole policy process. Though the re review process was consultative from national to district level, the level of engagement of diverse range of smallholders was very low. Although the policy review was in the interest of smallholders, the influence of this group during the consultation workshop was very low. Uh, the time frame for the workshop participants to examine the draft document was very short. Discussions were held in groups and smallholder participants could not be in all groups. The discussions were in English and women farmers and traders in particular were handicapped. The lesson from this process is to develop a strategy that elevates participation of smallholders in policy consultations. And to me, this is an area where social science researchers would be very valuable. Unlike the uh, poverty and social impact assessment I've just talked about, academic research tends to be unsolicited. Therefore, researchers try to engage with policy through the launch and dissemination workshops. And in this type of engagement, the findings are not necessarily fed into a policy process, but then they are available for use by policymakers or whoever needs the information. In my view, the example of the uh, poverty and social impact assessment is the preferred method where the policymaker or advocate demands for evidence. Uh, but more of such is possible if only there is demand for evidence from policymakers and advocates. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor. Um, I think that's been a, you, you, you mentioned that sometimes academics don't necessarily want to be advocates, but I can see that you're an advocate for the, for the voice of, 
of smallholder farmers and others in, in the policy uh, space. I mean, and, and that was a great uh, uh, setup, I think, for to, to, to move to Kwesi um, and to hear a little bit about how the, the Ministry of Food and Agriculture and particularly your role in engaging um, farmer-based organizations. Um, and and how, how, how do you address some of these um, challenges that uh, Professor Al-Hassan has, has noted, um, how, how to reach the most vulnerable, how to ensure that uh, language barriers are, are addressed, how to ensure that, that women farmers are included. Uh, can you give us a, a little bit of, of the experience for, from Ghana and the ministry in this? Yeah, uh, thank you all for the question. Uh, like you said, uh, I work with the Ministry of Food and Agriculture uh, in Ghana with the Extension Services uh, Directorate. Uh, basically, I work with the FBU unit as the deputy, probably deputy head, not the head, as, as you put it. Yes. Uh, so like, like I said earlier, I work with the with farmer groups. So the farmer groups like in the districts across the country, and we know that uh, farmer groups in Ghana mainly are uh, smallholder uh, farmers. So my job is uh, we go in there, if it's training, if it's capacity building, if it's uh, uh, enterprise development, we give it to them. So uh, I mean, we know they are, they are constrained in terms of uh, their economies of scale. So what we do is we we advise them because it's difficult as a probably as a one farmer or two farmers to to make a change in terms of policy direction. For instance, the teachers, teachers, uh, they have a voice because they have a strong association. Uh, doctors do, but we all know that farmers in Ghana are much more than the teachers than the doctors. So why is it that their voices are doesn't go that far? I mean, probably it's because. Uh, yeah, they are not well capacitated. I mean, we know uh, with a few, maybe a few groups like the APEX, like the uh, Greater Cap, the Port uh, Farmers Association, who are big organizations, they, they have the voice. But in the majority, compared to the smallholder uh, farmers. So, what we do is that we encourage them to come into groups, probably from the, from the district level, from the district level where they are, the regional level, and probably to the, to the national level where their voices could be heard. I mean, if you are at a national level, you are well-structured, then more of you be called to the, to the table, so to speak, for your voice uh, to be heard when, this, when these decisions are, are being made. So that's that not to say that it's not going on now. It's, it's been done now. For instance, you go to some of the districts, you have a real committees in which ordinary farmers are called for decision-making in extension, in uh, research, as well as in policy directions. And that is fed into the, the regional and then the national uh, level politics, uh, sorry, policies. So in short, uh, that's what I have to say. Thank you very much. Could, could, could you, I, I know there's a, a, just as a bit of a follow on, I, I know there's been programs in the past in Ghana um, of also uh, doing you know, study tours or, or taking uh, farmer-based organizations to, uh, to, to other farms to learn. Can, can you speak a little bit about that and, and how you feel that that type of a program may also uh, give those farmers a, a better insight uh, into the kinds of policies that would help them even if they're visiting a larger farm? Yeah, thank, thank you. Uh, that, that, that helps a lot, uh, the, the field trips for the farmer groups. Uh, so like more, more, in more times we try to take them to a farmer who is doing the same thing as they are, but the problem is a better, employing the better techniques. So we take them and say, oh, see, this farmer is doing what we are doing, but then he is probably applying what we teach them. So maybe he does A, B, C, do it. Sometimes we take them all across from one region to the other region, just for them to, to learn. I mean, to know that it's not what we tell them, but somebody actually is actually doing it somewhere and is benefiting. 
So we take them across country, across regions, and in some occasions, even across uh, to other countries. Uh, for instance, some years back, we took some to Australia. So it's not, it's not just in Ghana. So we try to, just for them to see how, how it's been done, not just how we say it's been done, but then for them to see that truly it can be done and it's possible when they employ the right techniques uh, with a little push here and there. Great. Thank you very much for that, uh, the, that explanation. I, I think that's quite insightful, actually, as, as an approach that, uh, that can be replicated. And as you note, um, uh, even beyond a, a single country, and of course, the case studies that we're collecting are from all over the world. So there's, there's lots of, uh, of good experience there. Um, and, and to that, I'll move to, to Adele now. Um, in addition to the role that the ministry can play or a ministry of, of uh, food and agriculture can play or the role that academics can play, um, you've been involved for, for a long time uh, with the UN system and, and research institutions, uh, the multilateral system and so forth. Can you speak a little bit to, to, to what you've seen, the experiences you've seen on how those organizations can also support the voice of, of smallholder farmers and, and, and particularly um, innovative ways that that's been done uh, across both geographies and across uh, sectors within agriculture. Adele? Thank you, Rob. Um, yes, I have some experience with, with, uh, with especially the CGIR system. Um, but also with the national and sub-regional organizations. But for now, let me focus on my experience with the CG. Uh, as many of you may know, the CG centers focus on smallholder concerns around the world. However, they've been traditionally biased towards technology development and dissemination. In recent times, they have expanded their scope to include value chains that include production, processing, marketing, and consumption of the commodities of their respective interests. All CG centers, as I understand it, have an interest in policy work. But one of them, the International Food Policy Research Institute, is particularly dedicated to policy research. Most of the other centers view policy work from technology development and dissemination Uh, perspectives. Um, Adil, uh, sorry, we're, we're, you're, you're breaking up a bit. Maybe if you can turn off your I video for the moment. That disease. Okay. Very well. Uh, let, let me repeat that then to say all CG centers have, a, have an interest in policy work, but one of them, the International Food Policy Research Institute, is particularly dedicated to policy research. Most of the other centers view policy work from technology development and dissemination, or more recently, from value chain development perspectives. IFPRI focuses on generation of data that informs policy dialogue, but desists um, um, from direct advocacy or policy formulation processes. Regarding smallholder involvement, they are variously incorporated through representation in strategic planning processes or priority setting processes or participatory technology testing processes and impact assessment processes. Now, these processes hardly link directly to policy formulation processes though. More recently, our CG centers have been challenged to achieve impact at scale. They have been piloting with advocacy processes that engage policy formulation more directly. However, in these processes, smallholder producers are involved through representation at national or regional levels. A good example of this would be International Potato Center's project on reaching agents of change. The project objectives were, one, to build institutional capacity 
of national research and extension organizations to develop and supply orange flesh sweet potato technologies to smallholder farmers in selected countries in Africa. Orange flesh sweet potato is rich in vitamin A, an important nutrient in human health. To build institutional capacities to influence policy in favor of nutrition-based health policies, this project trained representatives of selected farmer organizations and supportive um, NGOs, that's non-government organizations, or capacity building or community-based organizations as well in advocacy skills. The project also hosted national policy platforms in participating countries and supported smallholder agricultural producer representatives in regional policy fora. To mobilize resources in support, that's that objective is to mobilize resources in support of nutrition-based programs and projects in favor of smallholder agricultural producers. And in this regard, the reaching agents um, um, uh, project trained and coached representatives of supportive NGOs and CBOs in project design and implementation. This helped access to competitive brands from various donors. This initiative was subsequently broadened to include several other CG centers which were already working on nutrition food products such as iron beans with SEAT, yellow maize with SEMET, and yellow cassava with IITA. To conclude, my observation would be that whereas CG centers are dedicated to serve smallholder agricultural producers, and even though these centers have an interest in policy formulation processes, their involvement of the smallholder agricultural producers have remained through high level representation, consequently limiting their potential influence in policy processes by more inclusive approaches. This is why I think this initiative fills in an important gap in policy formulation processes in favor of smallholder agricultural producers. Thank you. Thanks very much, Adela. That, that's, that's extraordinarily helpful. And I think the, the, the point about um, uh, whether smallholders' voices are, are being heard directly from farmers or through uh, sub-regional organizations or national organizations is, is an important one. And particularly as we think about um, uh, how those organizations then interact both with government but also with the market. And here I want to, to move to Anthony. Uh, Anthony Morrison is the CEO of the Ghana Chamber of Agribusiness. Um, uh, we're glad that we can have you on and that we can see you on the video. I think there were some, some connectivity problems. Um, a number of the, of the panelists have mentioned value chains and then this point that I, that I just made. Could you, could you say a little bit about as agriculture moves up the value chain and of course the role of business and enterprises is connecting with farmers um, to, to create markets is, is critical. Um, how, how does the chamber engage with key stakeholders across that value chain, but particularly on the, on the one hand with, with farmers directly and on the other hand with government uh, related to, to policy and regulations? Over to you, Anthony. Right, um, thank you very much and uh, very good afternoon to my fellow panelists and uh, your good self. And uh, thank you once again to ASET for this invitation. Yes, uh, I must say the Chamber of Agribusiness uh, have, have been working very considerably in the area of policy advocacy and uh, as much as also trying to pull along the smaller holder farmers to appreciate the need for policy integration, policy involvement, and also to help them to understand what matters when it comes to um, the areas of policy education. Uh, four years ago, we introduced something called the Agri Agriculture Policy Schools for smaller holder farmers. This was a private sector collaboration, uh, mainly to drive in the need to give capacities to smaller holder farmers to understand uh, 
how policy formulation is done, the policy designing, and how the smaller holder farmer ought to see himself as a very important fulcrum in the whole policy design process. Um, it was very, um, very successful, but we realized that um, farmers or smaller holder farmers do not appreciate anything which is not material. Otherwise, things that are non material really doesn't see, uh, they don't really see as something that actually a mutual benefit. Uh, they have always been on the borderline of uh, advocating or pushing for materialistic things like input, fertilizer, seeds, boots, cut cutlass, um, I mean, things that help them in their production process. But when otherwise you tell them that, look, before you have access to all this, your decisions and your projections must be informed or must inform these uh, materials. So to bring it to you, they don't understand it. But the other challenge we faced was that farmers have absolutely no knowledge about policy decisions. And absolutely, they also do not have the, the impetus or the, the, the very technical uh, aspect of policy this, uh, for, uh, formulation. First of all, their standard of education, even though we do this through the local medium, that's in the, using the local languages, okay? We have adopted a very unique system, which is called uh, uh, the, um, the cartoons, the cartoon system, where we, we model cartoons to play to these people to understand how policy works. But above all, they expect that once you come to them and they have come together and tell you this is what we want, they expect some feedback, not in, in words or printed material. Uh, once they don't see these materials of this uh, produce coming in, any other engagement they, they want Anthony, I, I apologize. It's uh, breaking or you up a want bit. To can, you, can you turn your... The past one year is to train trainer of trainers from this rural... Uh, Anthony, can you turn your can video you off? Is it better now? Yeah, please go ahead. Okay. All right, so is it better now? Yes, that's that's better. Thank you. So what we have, okay, thank you. So what we have decided to do is to set up the trainer of trainer, a smaller holder farmer schools for policy uh, decision and uh, uh, policy planning. And these are schools, second cycle schools. So therefore understand the need for policy engagement. Now, with all this, what we I'm sorry, Anthony, we're losing your uh we have also had challenges with is that you do all these things, engage smaller with our farmers on their free. Anthony, I think we're going to move on. We we can't hear you. Um, the the connection is quite bad. But but um, uh, I want to say, firstly, we want to ensure that we do a case study on the ag policy schools. That was very interesting, and I, I'd love to learn more about that, um, as well as the training of trainers and and, and lines with what Adil had said about um, uh, providing coaching and mentoring. But a number of of uh, of the panelists have, have discussed the importance of communication. And so that's the perfect segue to, to come to our last panelist, um, Benjamin Fefor, who's the uh, regional director for uh, Farm Radio International. I'm not sure if it's only Ghana and, and Nigeria or all of English speaking West Africa. Maybe you can tell us a little bit about that, but particularly um, the experiences that, that you've had 
uh, with Farm Radio International of being able to connect to, to farmers and engage them and, and how that, um, that can then influence policy and, and, um, and other things. I mean, I, I know that there was a very successful program in Ghana, for example, that the Farm Radio International was involved in on uh, ensuring that, that farmers had uh, sacks that were uh, priced appropriately and, and in the right size and so on. So maybe you can give us a little bit of insight into to how Farm Radio International uh, does that and particularly the importance of communication. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ron. Farm Radio International is a communication for development organization and we work specifically in support of um, smallholder farmers. Our tagline is um, sharing knowledge, giving voice. We believe that um, when you do any of these radio programs um, or you communicate with um, farmers and you don't give them the necessary uh, opportunity to voice out what they are also thinking, then the communication is not complete. So we work in um, 12 African countries and I am in charge of um, the English speaking West African countries. Yes, we've been working with farmers for a long time. And I would say that we realize that farmers are very constrained when it comes to the issue of policy. Um, for a long time, when it comes to finance, input and other things, farmers get all these things very late. They complain and it still continues. Um, so you can see the, the policy to support farmers does not um, coincide with how they are reality in terms of seasonal farming and other activities um, run. With um, our work in Ghana, we realized one important issue that came out as a result of our work with um, the farmers within Brown Hafo and Ashanti region, where together with um, WFP, we train the farmers using radio and a mobile platform that allow the listeners to raise questions and make comments. And these are all recorded and reviewed by the project team and appropriate response is given using the radio. And as part of this process, it came out very clear that the farmers now have learned how to farm very well. They now know how to um, keep and um, ensure post harvest Lost, uh, post harvest management of the maize, but they were still not getting the right price. They were struggling with price, um, uh, people buying with uh, the bush, bush cut, where the bags that they bring to these farmers are more than 150 kilogram. So based on this, um, they agitated on radio. Um, they make a lot of issue about how everything that they buy, uh, for example, fertilizer is in kilos, but when they are selling, they sell um, using the bush rate. So it's um, generated a lot of discussion on the airwaves and the chief and elders um, came in at a point and they decided that this is the time to approach the political leaders who are very important power brokers within the sector. And using the radio, we also collaborated with other research institutions to identify the key issues within um, this um, lack of standard measure for farm produce. And as a result of this, we realized that there are so many other institutions or groups that are expected to benefit from um, the institution of um, weight and measure as a way of selling farm produce. So we identify the district assembly itself benefiting as a result of this. We also identify those loading in the market uh, because when they carry the heavy load, they can easily force it. Um, then we also identify the truck drivers uh, the women who are also buying because they can assess how much they, they are spending on whatever uh, they are buying. 
And through this, there were so many discussion on radio and, and also in other forum to broker um, the arrangement for doing this. And as a result of this, um, the district assembly together with all the other stakeholders agree that instead of just selling with the bush weight, they would rather use a, a, a sack that is approved and that is the only sack that will be used within uh, Jura and its environment. And this allows the farmers to have um, a, a way of measuring the maize that they were selling and the truck drivers were also able to have um, a, a right quantity that they need to carry when they are moving and the district assembly benefited out of this. Uh, we think that communication played a big role because farmers need to know and this information comes in the local language um, and then the programs are also done in a way that they are able to share their views, uh, which is very important in any policy formulation. Uh, so I think this has really helped in ensuring that um, the process of getting all the institutions that need to be part of this um, involved because there were uh, Ministry of Trade, Ministry of Food and Culture, Ghana Standard Board, um, businesses producing the SAC all coming on board as allies to ensure that the, this process goes on. Thank you. Great. Thanks very much, Benjamin. I, I, I have a follow-up question for you, but uh, just um, to all of our participants um, from around the world, uh, you can submit your questions on using the Q&A button on your taskbar. Um, we have a number of questions that have already come in and I will uh, turn to those just shortly. But I, I wanted to, to go back to one, one thing that, I mean, Anthony um, spoke about the, the challenge of getting farmers uh, engaged in a policy discourse, if you will, uh, that, that they will advocate for, for inputs, um, you know, material gain, but it's more difficult for them to see uh, a, a broader policy perspective. But in this case, those intersected, uh, that it was a, a policy change. And, and as you said, I mean, a, a very large number of stakeholders. I'd be interested, how, how specifically um, were, the, were the farmers' voices heard? W was, it, was it through regional organizations, such as Adil was, was referring to? Um, was it the farmers themselves coming to, to consultations? Can, can you give us a little insight to, to exactly how that worked? Thank you very much. It started with the farmers agitating on radio in their community meetings and also it moved to the level where they sent representatives to their chiefs and also to the district assembly. And this allowed the district assembly to contact seven other adjoining districts to also check whether they are also experiencing the same thing. And that led to the decision to bring a team together to ensure that the issues at stake are well investigated and then a plan put in place. Um, the role of the farmers was that they were really um, talking to the issue because this really affected them. They farm and they are not able to make ends meet because the market does not favor them. And uh, this affected them uh, because they have to sell um, at a lower cost than they are, they are spending. So it's something that um, directly affected them and they were ready to um, talk about it at every point. And I would say that it was not only um, the men, because we had a lot of women who were also um, farming and they were also talking about the same thing. When it comes to those buying the maize also, we have a lot of women involved and they were also not happy because they are not able to calculate the money given and what is given to them. So it was a broad uh, collaboration among all the farmers, men, women, um, who agitated for this. Thank you. Thanks very much, Benjamin. Um, and and I, I see already a great benefit of, of this dialogue in the, in the sense that uh, 
this, this would make another great case study of uh, different ways to, to approach uh, uh, ensuring the, the farmers' voices are heard in policy making. Let us now move to, to some of the, the questions that we're getting from, uh, from our participants. We have, so, so this is for uh, Professor Al Hassan, please. Um, it is Clement Mensa writing from Abidjan and asking particularly how we could potentially use this platform uh, to, to reach groups that can have an, an input or an impact, um, but may not be uh, always engaged. And, and particularly, Clement mentions young researchers and agriculture policy enthusiasts. So you, you work with, with, with students and, and young people in, in this field for a very long time. Do, do you have ideas about how we might be able to use this platform and, and the, um, the, the portal and the case studies and so on to, to engage more of these young people? Professor? Yes, um, I think, um, you know, we could have some kind of, uh, uh, whether to call it a size or a link, where you invite, you know, for random uh, ideas about issues onto the platform, uh, where you could also have a dedicated person to monitor what comes in so they can sift out the important issues for further discussion. And I'm saying this based upon my experience in the University of Ghana where we had some time back the economy of Ghana network, where it was just, you know, like a, a, a website where, you know, issues were discussed. There were moderators who would flag out certain issues depending on what was being discussed uh, of national interest at the time and put out an issue. Or even young researchers would bring out what they were doing and uh, put on the platform for people to discuss. But I must say that it wasn't very easy. It wasn't easy because it was rather very difficult to engage, to keep people visiting the site, finding out what was there and responding. Uh, so it didn't go far. But I think something like that, uh, you, you know, you need to find somebody who is really dedicated to, to doing this. And that's how we can reach, you know, people with interest in policy uh, to put in their views or even put in research ideas on policy issues. That's all I can say. Okay, thank you very much. We, we had another question that, that I actually want to, to put both to, um, to Anthony and to, to Hoisi. Um, and that's how, how can we use this platform uh, or, or what can we do to, to make it most attractive on the one hand to the private sector, to enterprise, and on the other hand to, to government? Um, what, what do you think would be the, the, the most uh, beneficial things that we could do with this platform to, to ensure that we can engage those two important stakeholders on, on at each end of the spectrum? Um, uh, Anthony, I'll go to you first. We may have lost Anthony. Um, so Kwesi, uh, I'll put that question to you, particularly um, related to, to, to government and how can such a platform uh, be most useful uh, to, to you and your colleagues? Yeah, thank you. Um, I think first of all, to make it more attractive, uh, it should be seen as probably solving, solving uh, the same problems we're all trying to solve. So. Uh, the objective of the platform should be should be known. Uh, how how beneficial will it be for the ministry for the ministry to come in? I don't know how far I don't know how far you went with in uh, dialoguing with the ministry before the platform is being rolled out. But uh, I think it should have been a very important important step. But be that as uh, it may, I think uh, once it's launched, we should we should engage further. Uh, we should you all see the benefits, the benefits of uh, of, of the platform operating. Once, once that, that is clearly shown, 
uh, I believe that the ministry would fully, fully on, on board, uh, if not at all, at least my, my unit, my department, since we work with the uh, pharma groups, I mean, well, for instance, I, I keep data on the pharma groups in the country. I keep uh, lots, of, lots of information on the pharma groups in the country, like it will help. So I think uh, once we know the benefits of it, once we dialogue more, I think that the ministry will be, will be in full support, if not already in support. That is great to hear. And, and we, we, we might want to, to also leverage uh, your network with other ministries of agriculture across the region um, yes. to, to have a, a group of champions for this. I think that would be, that would be great. Um, yeah, it seems that Anthony has, uh, has lost his connection. So I'm going to actually put the, the same question to Michael. Um, uh, as a, as a farmer-based organization yourself, how, how, how do you think, what, what, what would be the, the attributes that would make this platform the most successful for, for uh, the Greater Accra Poultry Farmers Association? Uh, thank you very much, Rob. Um, what can make um, the, this platform very attractive, uh, to the best of my knowledge, is um, one, what, what has begun, uh, the dialogue, and then uh, sharing of ideas. So once we keep it active, then it becomes uh, um, beneficial. The next thing I would say is um, we should have specific issues um, and targets. So say uh, the platform, uh, maybe not today because it's launching, but um, has say you want to, um, the, the one from radio said that uh, bags uh, now weighing, weighing the maize and helping the farmers. So in that case, um, can we uh, now replicate that in other areas? Um, say now it's been done in the Bravo region. Can we replicate it in the Shanti region or the Western region so that now the farmers begin to see the benefits of uh, uh, having this uh, uh, dialogue? And then the uh, when it does that, the, uh, the uh, gentleman from Minnesota Agri can also be pulled in uh, uh, to also ensure that the policymakers also hear. In, te in terms of that, I'm talking about the politicians because they also uh, carry some of these uh, uh, things with them. So that if we're able to do all of this and have specific targets, then uh, the, uh, this platform is going to go far and it's going to be very, very beneficial to the society. Great, thanks very much. Um, I have another question. Uh, this one is from Evelyn Jin. Um, so that's not to say where she's writing from, but, but uh, and I'll put this to, to a deal. Um, she says, why do we find shops run by farmers cooperatives in Western countries, yet it seems difficult to organize it in African countries? It seems cooperatives function only when it comes to purchase and distribute inputs, not in packaging, processing, and selling. Asset is actually doing some work in, in this space um, uh, for Ghana and, and Kenya. Um, but Adil, I, I know you've, you've worked with, uh, with cooperatives um, in, in various ways. Could, could, could you speak to this and particularly how cooperatives might, if, if they um, were, were involved in more of the value chain, uh, also be able then to, to uh, have more of the Af African farmer's voice, Adil? Yes, I, I think that cooperatives um, are potentially very uh, useful mechanisms to bring farmers to organize with, object, with, with, with the agreed objectives at the back of their minds. Um, the challenge though has been in getting um, the farmers organize effectively and to rally their priorities and focus in one unison. The risk of being hijacked by those that uh, they employ to organize the cooperatives who may not themselves be committed farmers with a, with a farmer interest at heart. I think that um, in my experience in, in developing countries, in Africa particularly, there would need to be very concerted capacity building 
uh, for the farmers to take charge of the cooperatives that they manage so that they can get the results for which they aspire and to the extent possible running it themselves rather than delegating it to agents who could easily um, betray them. Um, I, I am aware of many cooperatives, uh, coffee cooperatives and others that have been run down by officials who in the name of, 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 of farmers um, carry them away from the farmers need. So there is a catch there. It, it, they are potentially useful mechanisms, but I think uh, the need for capacity building in that area would be quite necessary, I would think. Thank you. Thanks very much, yeah. Um, and do, do you have examples of, I mean, we have lots of examples where cooperatives have been run down and, and uh, I mean, a classic uh, a case of, of uh, the, the management of the cooperatives not necessarily representing the interests of, of the farmers. But, but have you seen examples where the farmers actually use their voice to, if you will, wrest control back of the, the cooperatives and, and turn that situation around? Um, not that I can think of immediately, um, but I know that the idea, the, the idea is coming up in a second generation movement where they're, they're avoiding the use of cooperatives um, and calling them other things uh, uh, that they, with the effort to capture the control. But, but let me think over that and maybe I could get an example a little later. So, so, so we, we've identified another case study, but this one that we need to find uh, the case study, not a, of an example that has, has been discussed. I think that would be a, a very interesting case study. Um, That's true. Yeah, so um, we have a question from Michael Nkono. Uh, Michael is, is with the uh, Open Society Foundation. This is our focal point. Um, this question, um, I'll put first to, to Professor Al-Hassan, um, and it's because it's specific to, to Ghana. And we, we mentioned the political economy dimensions a bit earlier, but can you say a bit about, his question is, what is the political economy of agriculture in Ghana like? And is agricultural advocacy effectively underpinned by robust data and information? Professor, over to you. The political economy of agriculture in Ghana. Um, I think it's diverse. We have, you know, the gender perspective is something that is usually championed and comes to the fore immediately. But you also have now uh, issues of, uh, you know, capture of political uh, policy capture by elite farmers. And this is something that uh, I think the ministry ought to be very aware of because it is these types of farmers who have the influence and can walk through the doors of uh, corridors of power and make negotiations in their favor. And so I think, uh, yes, gender, the vulnerable and so on are important but the more lacking one is the political capture by the more elite farmers, which I think the ministry ought to be uh, aware of. Uh, the second part of the question was what? If you can, Floyd, if you can, the second part of the question. Yeah, and the, the second part was, and is, is agricultural advocacy effectively underpinned by robust data and information? So do those who are advocating for policy change actually have the information they need? I, and I think this is what my uh, earlier presentation was on, that seldom do you have that demand for evidence and therefore they need to use data. More and more, I think with the ICT era, there are you know, movements to compile data on uh, farmers, their land sizes, the demand for inputs, and so on. But it's not that broad. But these are things that, uh, uh, you know, marketing or uh, 
price data collected, like the ISOCO and so on, are engaging because they need to know the numbers to say this is what the, these are the inputs that traders could be selling and at what price and so on. But in terms of using that for policy, um, you know, it's more like the IFPRI using the data to give us, you know, some policy research, but whether it feeds directly into what somebody, the person responsible at the Ministry of Agriculture wants uh, is another issue. So there's a lot of policy evidence there, but who is using it uh, is not clear because there is no express demand for that evidence. This is what I can say. Okay, thank you very much. Actually, I, I want to turn that question, the same question about the political economy to, to Anthony. Um, we, uh, we, we also often think about the political economy in the context of uh, government and NGOs and farmers and so on, but of course, the private sector is an important player in that, uh, in that political economy as well. Can you give some insights and, and particularly if um, there are ways that working with the private sector um, and smallholder farmers that, that we can positively impact that political economy. And, and, and I think as Professor noted, um, you know, the, the issue of, of uh, elite capture, political captures is a very, very real one. Over to you, Anthony. Uh, thank you very much. Yes, uh, of course, the political economy in Ghana is quite diverse and sometimes can be very complicated as well. Um, if you take a look at the, our policy regime, uh, you, you come up with a whole policy and the government comes to power with a manifesto. So um, there is this um, entanglement as to which one should prevail. So the, the government uh, promises to the people for which they were voted for cease to uh, take or to, to cease to proceed over uh, most of the, the, the ongoing policies that has been running. And on the side of the farmer or the value chain players, uh, it has also disrupted a number of uh, projections to the economy because, for instance, uh, before the planting for food and jobs, before the uh, PED and many other uh, interventions from this government, we have seen some level of some uh, intervention from the previous government. And before the previous government, there was a youth in agriculture project that was also world strengthened. But now we do not have it. So it's, it, it comes on board as a disruption uh, of most of government ongoing intervention. And that brings on board the sustainability and uh, many other things uh, to which the political economy has up, uh, come to affect. And it also does affect uh, investment because um, if they can look at the long-term projections of um, the, uh, a country's policy, no investor is ready to put in money there. And no investor is ready to put in money because of a government a promissory manifesto. So we need to actually look at the role of NDPC, how they come up with the short-term, medium-term, and long-term uh, development goals, and how the, the Ministry of Agriculture tapped into that to develop all their uh, uh, framework. Okay, the framework is put together by NDPC, but more far, taps into it to develop their short-term and their medium-term goals. Now, how or while this goes on, we need to look at the nationalistic priority rather than the government manifesto priority. Because most government manifesto priorities do not or are not sustainable. And most of them do not have the funding and do not also affect the generality of the value chain. So we, we need to be to be consistent. We need to come up with um, some stopgap measures that will realign um, our projects, both government and the private sector, irrespective of uh, how the political economy goes. Because if you look at the CADEP, the CADEP says that yes, 10% investment into uh, agriculture from the local budget, but we don't see that. No government is able to do that. The European Union, uh, USAID and the likes have been consistent with their budgetary allocation. That is the reason why they are where they are today. So we need to be consistent with policy. Policy has to be sustainable. 
policy have to find a way to be dynamic and robust, irrespective of the political or the economic regime. That's what I have to say. But um, on the other thing Prof was referring to, with regards to the advocacy and uh, sharing of information and how we carry these things along the line. I must say that data is very critical in advocacy. At the same time, it's very critical in the projection and designing policy. How do we get these policies as a country? How do we get this data as a country? Okay, it's, it's very difficult. If you look at our current uh, sector policy, there is no uh, investment or there is no budgetary allocation for research. Okay, then you come, you ask yourself, what are we bringing on board? Where do we have the data from to inform some of these uh, policies that we have initiated or put together? Some of these uh, data also are outdated five years, six years, seven years. And these are the current data that we are working with for, uh, for the next future, which is not possible for the investor. Okay, then also within the industry, the private sector, we do not communicate enough. It's either they are uh, being selfish, greedy to uh, give out information so that the industry grows. So there is no sharing of information along the line. That is why the chamber has instituted the Ghana Agriculture uh, uh, Data System, so we can, data management system. So we can probably work along most of most of the people within the value chain, the DPs, and MUFA itself to help align some of this uh, data and be more consistent with what inform uh, decision makers and policy makers with what or how, how they go about how to design this policy because it's very important. As it stands now, no one knows what is the current number of uh, smaller holder farmers in Ghana. When you ask a, a MOFA person, he gives you a different person. But I tell you, they said the budget is, um, they said the data is what- I'm sorry, Anthony, we're going to need to leave it there. Um, because we have to move on to the presentation, um, but extraordinarily important points, both, both on a long-term common vision uh, that supports all sectors of, of the economy, as well as, as access to information, and certainly the point you make on uh, uh, the private sector not always being open to share information is an important one as well. Um, we have a number of other questions still from our participants. We will try to answer those on social media over the coming days. Uh, with this, I want to, to thank the panelists and everyone who, uh, who asked questions. And I want to turn over to Kojo from our communications team, and he's going to do a demonstration of the portal itself. Over to you, Kojo. Thank you, Rob. Um, first of all, let me say that the portal is still a work in progress, and we are welcome and open to um, suggestions to improve the portal. Um, the second version of this portal will take a lot of comments from the panelists here and the participants on how to improve the portal. The aim of this portal is to ensure that we bring policymakers and smallholder farmers, academia together in a dialogue um, for us to make policy making inclusive. Now, the, the portal is such that anyone can access it from any um, device. Uh, we've made it mobile friendly, such that farmers, because we know farmers do not have um, desktop or laptop on, in their farms, we try to make it very accessible even on mobile devices. So it's a very mobile friendly portal that we, are, we worked on. Okay, so the, the meat of this portal is the case studies page. Now the case studies page is where we put all the case studies created by the team, the asset team on this portal. Now when you go here, you'll be able to identify or find case studies that you can relate with. When you click on any of the images or the headings, it takes you directly to the case studies. The portal as of now has been uploaded or completed with some case studies that we believe users will start interacting with and then putting their comments in there. And an important feature of this portal is the search or filter tool. Now, when you get to the portal, there are a lot of case studies and we know that you don't have so much time. Farmers don't have so much time. The academia just wants something quick 
and then comment or share a knowledge piece and then move on. So we put in the filter option for you to easily identify case studies. The filters are grouped into three main categories. The first one is the subject, and then the subjects are um, five broad subjects. So all case studies will be under five broad subjects, um, the input market, output market, production, research, and development. And then if you don't find your case studies by subjects, you can decide to go by regions where we group the case studies into case studies coming from Africa, Western Africa, Eastern Africa, Southern America, or global. So you can find one or two cases in say Africa. That would be also in Western Africa. So this helps you to easily identify case studies. If the regions doesn't work for you, then simply you can just use the last filter which is also about countries. So wherever the, the case study is coming from, whichever country is coming from, we are able to index it on the portal. So you'll be able to assess the case study based on countries. Now let's go into one of the case studies. This is a case study that was created by one of our team members, Johannes. And the case studies are designed such that they are very short, answers five key questions. So you don't need to read um, a whole page to identify what the issue was or what uh, worked for the smallholder farmer and how that process can be replicated across Africa. So we've summarized all case studies in the way that you can easily um, use these case studies uh, or comment on these case studies. Now an important feature is the download case study feature. Here we are able to, any user is able to download the original case study um, in a PDF format. So if you want to get more details on whatever we've created on the portal, you have the opportunity to go and download a PDF and then get uh, more knowledge on that. Now, this is very important and I must emphasize that we encourage users of the portal to engage with the portal because that is when we'll be able to influence policy and decision making that affects smallholder farmers. So if you are into any of the case studies, you can, once you scroll up or down, we made it such a way that a pop-up comes to remind you that you can join the discussion. Now, the moment you click on that pop-up, it takes you to the comment section where you can make a comment or make a, a suggestion or ask a question. Also, you can share the, um, any, interesting th any interesting thing on the portal. Once you highlight a portion of the uh, text, you see the social media icons, if you can share on WhatsApp, Facebook, LinkedIn, and Twitter. Um, this way, we believe that uh, you'll be able to send a message or users will be able to send the message across. Uh, if you find a certain part interesting, the comment section is there. Important to notice that we've made it in a way you need to notify, click the notify box. If you do that, what happens is when you ask a question and assuming Adele has more knowledge in um, that area and decides to respond to your question, you get the notification right into your email. This is important because we don't want people to lose track of the discussions that are going on um, on the portal. So we encourage users that although we, you want to stay anonymous or you want to make com comments without your name, it's important you click on the notify me follow up button such that when you make a comment, you can get update on that. Now, as I said earlier, we've designed this portal to be responsive. Um, anyone accessing it or the desktop will be able to access it friendly. So as you can see, the desktop version is clean and neat. So if you're using a laptop or your PC, you should be able to access it nicely. We also understand that a lot of people use their tablets these days. So the portal has been designed that it will be able to appear on your uh, tablet and you can do everything that you do on your desktop on your tablet. Also, the mobile phone is key in these days. Um, most, all of us have mobile phones, smartphones. Most of us have smartphones now. Farmers have feature phones that they are able to access internet. So therefore, the key portion of this portal is to make it friendly such that if the farmer is on the farm and wants some information on uh, certain things that worked in say Tanzania and he is in Nigeria, he's able to log onto the platform and search that case study 
and identifies that thing and wants to ask a question, you can just put the question there and the team is ready to respond to it. And you can get instant response as well. Now, this portal was um, made possible by a, a group of people from Asset. And this team is made up of Belinda, George Boatin, Dr. Edward Brown, who, who gave us the opening remark, Johannes, whose case study we used for this presentation, Adele, who is on the panel, Nirav, and then myself. We, we are open to comment, as I said, and so we invite people to give us suggestions on how to improve this uh, portal. Thank you. Okay, so if you want to assess it, it's just smallholdervoices.asset for Africa. But once you type in smallholder voices, it's been optimized for all search engines, so it will, it will pop up in your browser. Thank you. Thank you. Over to Thank you, you, Rob. Thank you very much, Kojo. That was, that was great and very exciting. I, I, and I, I love that, uh, uh, that it's going to be applicable to, to mobile phones, uh, which is, of course is very important. Also that there's a kind of a rapid response uh, function and that we'll be able to, to leverage global experts. And I think we have uh, many on our panel that we may be uh, reaching out to, to, to help us on this uh, going forward. Um, so we have uh, just a few minutes left. I'm going to turn back to, to Ed Brown uh, to give a bit of a summary and a vote of thanks. Um, just let me say my thanks to the team that Kojo just mentioned. There's lots of work that goes into these things behind the scenes. And of course, to our panelists, uh, very much appreciated that, that you've taken the time and, and shared your expertise. And again, to Open Society Foundations, which is our financial partner in, in this endeavor. Ed, over to you to close. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Um, just want to give a, I mean, thanks to everyone who participated. I, I think we had at some point about 61 participants. Now we have uh, 56. So it's a quite large audience. and. Uh, I, I hope that this has been um, a very interesting conversation, is the beginning, and we hope that um, uh, we would be able to continue to provide, I mean, this platform to ensure that, um, you know, uh, people, I mean, that the voices of the smallholder farmers can be heard. We encourage further participation on the portal. As John said, please read the case studies and give feedbacks, reach out to Asset via the portal if you would like to co-develop content. Uh, I also want to emphasize the importance of innovating. What is an opportunity to use different medium to reach out to the small of um, the, the issue that, that was raised, I think, by the first uh, uh, panelist about the language challenge that smallholder farmers face, uh, I think we need to look at how best you can reach out to that particular group, that audience, who may not have effective voice because they have challenges in, in, in the kinds of uh, information that is required. Um, please share the portal links with your network and uh, this will be sent to all participants post the webinar. Um, we know that a number of the questions have not been answered but this will be taken on as Rob said and we will share the responses on, on, I mean, on the portal. So we encourage you particularly to, to try and continue to work, I mean, participate in this portal to provide information. If there are case studies you can upload there, let us know, and then we can do that. The, the key thing about this portal, what we're looking at, well, what is the key performance indicator we're looking at here? We want to be able to help bridge that gap between smallholder farmers and policymakers to ensure that their voices are held ahead you know, I mean, the issue that, that the, uh, the poultry, uh, uh, I mean, panelist mentioned about land, it's a very important thing, urban encroachment on land. How do you do, deal with the land issue? In fact, in our second uh, African Transformation Road Report, the Agriculture Road Report, land was one of the major bottlenecks in terms of modernizing agriculture. And I think the point that was raised by the poultry farmer is quite poignant in this respect. We need to continue to provide more information, 
deep dive into the challenges that uh, the farmers face in order to ensure that policy will be well informed. I, I mean, one of the things that, that I heard which is very interesting is that he said that the farmers are not interested in policy. They only want the, you know, uh, I mean, the money, the products, and so on. Of course, that's what they want. I think to the extent that you hear the farmers, then you can then take the information to, you know, build policies that would respond to their needs. The key thing is that you are listening to the farmers, that is the policymakers, and you are processing the data, providing evidence, as Prof said, that the demand for evidence is going to be important. And what we can do with this portal is to see how we can broker knowledge between farmers and the uh, policymakers in order to ensure that uh, the community of farmers, uh, you know, get their fair share of the development um, uh, programs that is evolving in the countries. So once again, let me thank everyone for coming, and we hope that uh, we would continue to engage on this platform in order to ensure that uh, uh, we can provide the necessary support to ensure that agriculture is being modernized and, and also being the leverage for transformation, driving transformation. Thanks, everyone, and good evening or good morning, wherever you are. I think those in the US are still in the morning, is it? Yeah, good afternoon. Bye.